Exodus 33 is where I'm launching from. And this scripture is of particular importance to me because uh, it is the text that I use for the first time that I ever spoke in front of people. And I was asked at the age of 12 to bring a devotion, and I brought that devotion from this text, Exodus 33, 11. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. As a 12-year-old boy raised in church, and uh, I was never, ever David, I was always Doug and Jenny's son. Is there any kids here that can relate to that? You know, you're not a person in yourself. You're just their son. And, uh, and I was in church and the platform and the preachers and God were very distant and far. And I remember as a 12-year-old boy coming to this revelation that I could have friendship with God, that God was interested in me, even though I was 12 years old. And so when I was asked to lead the devotion, that's the scripture that I use at a Royal Ranger camp at Lake Leshenaltia. <laughs> Exciting stuff. But do you know, even today... You know, 50-something years later, I'm still intrigued by this scripture because to many people, and perhaps many of you sitting here today, God is still distant. He's a story from long ago. Uh, You know, he's the God of the Bible, but he's not the now God. But the Bible says that the Lord would speak to Moses face to face in the same way that a man would just speak with his friend. And my heart is that you would know God in that same deep and intimate way. That was my pitch when I was 12 years old in that first devotion. And all these years later, it is the same. The passion of my heart is that you would know God in that face to face. He is my friend, that deep and intimate way that you would know him as your friend. To many people, God is distant. God is far. You love him. You appreciate him, but you've never been close. And I would love for you to have a close encounter with the living God. 2 Corinthians 3 in the message translation says, whenever they, and for reference he means the church, whenever the church turned to face God as Moses did, God removes the veil And all we need to know about the veil, there's a whole lot of theology there, but for us reading it, all we need to know is that God removes the barrier. God removes anything that is between you and Him. And you may have come in here this morning and you might be far from faith. Listen, you are the most important person in the building. This church exists for you. If you're here today and you say, I've got doubts I've got fears. You might even say, I've got barriers. I've got walls. I've got things between me and God. Listen, you're in the right place. This is a church that loves you and cares about you and wants to walk that journey with you. But the Bible says that God can remove the barrier that's between you and Him. Isn't that good news, church? God removes the veil and there they are face to face. They suddenly recognize That God is a living, personal presence, not a piece of chiseled stone. And when God is personally present, a living spirit, that old constricting legislation is recognized as obsolete. In other words, that whole idea of religion that it's just about rules, that is you can't do this and you mustn't do that and you shouldn't do that. You'll be rewarded if you do that. You'll be penalized if you do that. He's saying that When God is personally present as a living spirit, that old idea, that old way of it being all about the rules is obsolete. And he says, we're free of it, all of us. Nothing between us and God, our face is shining with the brightness of his face. And so we're transfigured, much like the Messiah, where our lives gradually become brighter and more beautiful as God enters our lives and we become Like him. Isn't that powerful? They're saying that you can have literally an encounter with God that will literally transform you and change you and make you more like him. 
I don't know about you, but you know, listening to Kim talking about robots, as soon as I say cl- close encounters, just because of my age, I think close encounters are the third kind. Yeah. Anyone with me? I think UFOs. As soon as I see, so I so I did a little research on UFOs, and uh, so people that people that um, study UFOs are, are called ufologists. Serious, I'm serious. And the, the, the science, the practice, is called ufology. U-F-O-L-O-G-Y, ufology. Look it up, Wikipedia. You'll see, you'll, you'll, the most reliable, rec- no. But it's really, it's kind of, you know, have you ever been busy doing stuff, you're really busy, and then you see something on the internet, and then half an hour goes by, and you think, oh, I was supposed to be doing a sermon, and you come back over here. So, you know, you can, you can have some fun there reading about UFOs and Uf, U, ufologists and ufology and all that kind of stuff. But here's, after reading all of that, here's what I condensed it down to. The people that are most convinced about UFOs, in fact, I was thinking about even asking how many people here believe in UFOs? But then I thought, y- y- even if you did, as one brave guy, <laughs> but even if you did, you probably wouldn't for fear of the ridicule of uh, those. So I'm not even going to ask you. But this is what I found. The people that are most convinced about UFOs are those who, have cl- who claim to have had an encounter. Right? The people that are most convinced are the ones that claim to have had some kind of encounter. Now, many of us or some of us have heard about others having close encounters and we're not convinced. And it's only when you've had your own encounter, according to the research, that you become convinced. And then once you become convinced, you don't care what others think because you're convinced. I was down there in the South Paddock Late at night, and I, you know, and you don't care what anyone says because it's your encounter. I was thinking about this. Um, have you ever had a great experience and then tried to communicate to someone how great it was and struggled? You know, I did hot air ballooning. My kids um, bought it for me as a gift, you know, a birthday experience, and I did hot air ballooning which sounds like what 65-year-old people do. <laughs> but it really was something. It was, it, was, it was awesome. And so when I came back down, and I'm trying to explain, you know, the rush and what I felt, or, you know, they're, they're kind of looking at me going, yeah, yeah. You know, they got that, that glazed over. Have you ever done, you ever been on a holiday? You come back from the holiday and you're telling them, and we went here and we saw this and we went in and it was amazing. And, you, and you're excited. And then you're looking at their face and you realize that they're not getting it. And so we usually end those conversations with a familiar sentence. We would say, you know what? You had to be there. And what we're saying is you have to have your own close encounter. You have to have your own experience of it. And, you know, being perfectly frank, the challenge I feel as a pastor is I get up here every week and, you know, I've got my Bible stories and I've got my Bible texts and I've got my explanations and I'm, you know, I've got three points on this and five points on that and I'm just, you know, I'm excited. I know it, I believe it, I'm, I'm going. And then a lot of times I'll look out at you And I just get a sinking feeling. It's like, they're not getting it. (coughs) And you know, all I can think to do is create an environment here at church that leads you incrementally to your own experience. And it may not happen the first week you walk through the door, the first month or the first year, I don't know how long it takes, But what I feel to do as a pastor is line upon line, precept upon precept, story upon story, is to try every week to draw you to that place where you eventually have your own experience. You have your own close encounter. We need close encounters of the God kind in our lives. And here's my pitch. Number one, 
We need power, not just words. Would you agree with me? We need power, not just words. Why? Because some of us are facing situations that words can't fix. You know, I remember going on missions trips as a young pastor, and I think I was probably 23 years old when I first started traveling to you know, countries like the Philippines and Mexico and India and in these developing countries going in and, and being part of a team, somebody preaching a big healing crusade and then being a part of the team that support that. And in, in those um, early trips, I very quickly realized that if you prayed for people to be healed, you didn't have to preach much. In, in that if somebody got healed, it changed everything. And, and like, for instance, one particular time stands out to me. We were in Cebu City in the Philippines. And you know when you're in a country and everything's happening in another language and you just feel really disconnected, you're not sure all of what's going on. But we're in this large hall and there's probably 1,000 to 1,500 people crammed in there. And somebody, one of the team got up and preached and it's translated and, you know, it's, it's just all happening. And then they start praying for people. They probably only preached 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, and they started praying for people. And so they're praying and, you know, believing God. And it's exciting just to be in the Philippines and to be in that atmosphere. And then all of a sudden, the, the place erupted. And the crowd began to part. And in, in the middle of all that we're doing, there was a 12-year-old boy there that, was walking down the aisle and as he's walking down the aisle the place just comes unglued and we had no idea what was going on but we found out later that this kid had had cerebral palsy and had never walked from birth he was there in a wheelchair and in the midst of this preaching and praying and all that was going on this kid had an encounter with God and he got up out of that wheelchair and walked forward. And, you know, we, we never really were able to fully understand what was going on. But what we could see is that people were crying out to God. People were turning to God. Not because any one of us had preached an eloquent sermon, but because the presence of God healed powerfully. And out of this one little boy's encounter, that whole room was transformed and changed. The Apostle Paul said, I came to you in weakness and fear. And with much trembling, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words. And it's interesting that he says that because he could have preached with wise and persuasive words. He had the education. He had the ability to do that. But he, he chose by, by decision of his will. He said, I, I chose not to come to you with wise and persuasive words, with an incredible sermon. But he says, but with a demonstration of God's, of the Spirit's power, so that your faith may not rest on men's wisdom. Come on, somebody. So that your faith would not rest on my preaching. Oh, Dave's there today. Great. Praise the Lord. We're going to get, oh, Dave's not there today. Oh, this is, oh, if I would have known, I wouldn't have come. <laughs> come on, somebody. But Paul says that so that your faith may not rest on men's wisdom. He said, I, I eschewed it. I, I, I did not do that. But he said, but so that your faith would rest on God's power. We need power not just words. Here's the second thing we need. We need an encounter, not just an explanation. I'm not going to share my salvation testimony, but I, I'm going to say this about how I got saved. I did not get saved because of a well-preached sermon. I got saved because I had an experience with God. And we need, we need that. You need that. It's not, it's not a case of keep preaching, Dave, and one day you're going to convince me and then I'm going to give my life to Jesus. Listen, you don't need to have an explanation. You don't need to have some sort of argument satisfied in your mind. You need an encounter with God. A person who has had an encounter with Jesus will never be at the mercy of someone who has a fine-sounding argument. Explanations have never changed someone's life. Encounters have. I like this scripture in John 9. Finally, they turned again to the blind man and they're all you know, trying to decide whether Jesus is legit. 
And they've had this big argument in front of this blind guy and they turn to him and say, well, what have you got to say about him? He replied, well, whether he's a sinner or not, you know, all this stuff you're talking about, I don't know. But one thing I do know is I was blind, but now I see. No explanation, no argument, none of that. Just I had an encounter. Man, I was blind, but now I see. And this is what real Christianity is all about. You don't need the fear that you don't have the ability to, 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 to duel with somebody intellectually and, and somehow put forward an incredible argument. There are people that can do that, and you may develop into that as time goes by. But what you need before you ever get to that is you need an encounter with God yourself. Here's the third one. We need presence, not just practice. You know, here at Real Church, we have liturgy. We have order. You can impress your friends when they come. Lean over to them during the third song and say, this will be the last song. <laughs> and, and when it finishes, they're going, what? how did you know that? Before it even happens, you say, some guy's going to get up, gives a little talk about communion. And so if suddenly a guy gets up and does a little talk about communion. Yeah, Pastor Dave's going to get up. Sounds like he's going to go on forever, but he'll stop it, stop it about 11. <laughs> right? Because every week, it's our liturgy. It's our order. It's our ritual. It's, it's kind of, it, it's what we do. It's our practice. But listen to me, more than that, we need the presence of God. That our, our, our hope and our confidence is not that, you know, by having three songs, communion, a short message, and then a cup of coffee, that'll get us all into heaven. That, that, that's the ritual. That's the practice. But listen, we, we need the presence of God. If we remain in liturgy and never experience presence, something on the inside starts to die. Paul wrote, it stands to reason, doesn't it, that if the alive and present God who raised Jesus from the dead moves into your life, he'll do the same thing in you that he did in Jesus, bringing you alive to himself. When God lives and breathes in you, and he does as surely as he did in Jesus, you are delivered from that dead life. With his spirit living in you, your body will be alive as Christ. He's saying the same, exact same thing that happened in Jesus can happen in your life. The exact resurrection power that conquered death in Jesus' life and raised him can happen in your marriage. It can happen in your health. It can happen in your emotions. No matter what is dead and dying in your life, a Resurrection can take place. Why? How? Because of the presence of God. And we can learn this from the story of others. And I just want to close by just giving you a story and a couple of points just to finish it off. And the story I want to speak of is, is Jacob's encounter with God. And the reason I chose that story is because it's the first time in the Bible that the phrase face to face is mentioned. One of the things that we learned at Bible college is one of the laws of interpretation is the law of first mention. That when something is mentioned first in the Bible, it's quite often the purest, um, it's the purest form of those words or that principle. So the law of first mention is very important. And this is the first time that this idea of speaking to God face to face is mentioned in the Bible. Many of you know the story of Jacob, born a twin to Esau. His brother was the masculine, tough, you know, man's man, very much favored by his father. And Jacob was not. We might even go as far as to say Jacob was a mummy's boy. And this plays out in his life. Jacob, the name actually means deceiver. That's what, that's what his name means. And we know, because we have the history of his life, he spent his life lying, manipulating, and deceiving people. Stole his brother's birthright and, you know, there's a whole story there. And then remember the whole story with, with Rachel and Leah and he, you know, he worked seven years, get, and then they switch the brides on the wedding night and it's, it's a fun story to read. But it's all a result, it's kind of like payback for Jacob's own lying and manipulation. <coughs> 
And so, you know, after that weird marriage thing, uh, he's, he's basically his life ends up in chaos and he's on the run. Now, can I just say, how many of you know that when you build your life on lies and manipulation and deceit, that's the ultimate end for every one of us? Chaos and you're on the run. And so this, this is um, Jacob, he's, he's in chaos, he's on the run, and then he finds out that Esau is after him, and he knows that Esau is going to kill him. He knows his brother, his twin brother is coming to kill him. He's afraid. He has a restless night, the night before Esau is due to arrive. In Genesis 32, it describes that night and says, so Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him. When it, when it says a man wrestled with him, in the original language, it actually means, in its truest form, angel or spirit of Jesus. And so that, that's what m- most scholars would feel like it was the spirit of Jesus, not in his fleshly form, but spirit of Jesus, came and wrestled with Jacob till daybreak. And when the man, the angel, the spirit of Jesus, saw that he couldn't overpower him, so Jacob's just this resisting, strong, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. In other words, he he physically touched him in such a way we know he walked with a limp for the rest of his life. I mean, he just just touched, he's wrestling, 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 trying to gain dominance. The guy, Jacob won't give up, he's obstinate, he's stubborn. And so this angel, the spirit of Jesus, just touches him in the socket of his hip and literally puts his leg out and he walks with with a limp for the rest of his life. You might ask why. Why, 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 did, why did God do that? Well, sometimes it's the only way that God can move in us. If you don't, he will. You know, I think one of the revelations that's come to me in my old age is the revelation of humility. And I don't think that young people strive for that enough. And our society is built I think against humility and it promotes pride and arrogance and having the last word or the quickest word. But to me, as I get older, I look back and realize the power was always with humility. And the thing I found out about God is that if you don't find humility, if he has a plan for your life, then he will humiliate you. And you'll end up humble one way or the other. And I believe that was the case here, is that Jacob was just so stubborn and so obstinate, but God's like, I've got a a purpose for your life. And he humiliated him. He touched him in such a way that it would become evident to everybody that he had lost some kind of battle. Then the man said, let me go, for it's daybreak. In other words, here's this angel saying, I've had enough, I'm done. It's nearly daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And we can easily just read over those words and say, again, this is just Jacob striving and grasping for whatever he can get. It's not at all. There's something about his words. When he says, um, I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me, it's not the word that's used in the original for bless. It's not like money. It's not possessions. It's not prestige. It's none of those outward things. When he says, I want you to bless me, he's talking about an internal joy. That, that's the literally internal joy. So what happens, something in the course of wrestling, something happened to Jacob's life, and as he wrestles, he realizes something needs to shift inside of me. Come on, somebody. That's a, that's a good place to say amen for every single one of us. Something needs to shift in me. Come on, we spend all our time ranting and raving about this person and that relative and they said this and they did that or this circumstance and and if it wasn't for my boss and if I had had some more money and you know we're ranting and raving against everybody around us but Jacob in the midst of this wrestle comes to this revelation, something needs to change in me. I need to change. And he said, now we're here and you've touched my hip and we battle all night, but I'm not going to let you go because I've had a revelation. Something has to shift in me. And he said, I want you to bless me. And the man asked him, what's your name? And we know why he asked, because it revealed something about who Jacob really was. Jacob, he answered, deceiver, you know, manipulator, liar. (coughs) Excuse me. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, 
but Israel, because you've struggled with God and men and have overcome. So here's this powerful moment that he's literally transformed and he's changed. But look at Jacob's response. Jacob goes, okay, well, tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? And then he blessed him there. So Jacob immediately goes to the intellectual. Well, what's your name? It might be a name I can drop later. Oh, I was there at that place with you. Yeah, you know him too? Yeah. I fought with him all night. Right, it's, it's, all, it's, all, it's all here. He goes, you, you don't need more knowledge. You need to know stuff. You don't need to drop names. You, you, don't, you don't need any of that stuff. What you need is an experience, and he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Penal, saying, it's because there I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. Three things, and I close with these three things. Three things that are happening here that will show you what you can do in your first steps of a close encounter. Number one, there needs to be a new strength. There needs to be a new strength. If you want God to move in your life, at some point you have to say, I'm done. I'm done. I'm exhausted. I'm tired. I'm going to give up my efforts. I need your spirit, your life your power inside of me. You know what your prayer needs to be at that moment? Lord, I give up. Isn't that a hard prayer to pray? Because we're, we're taught by the modern Christian world, that I'm breaking through, I'm pressing in, I'm reaching out. I'm here. You know, a better prayer might be, Lord, I give up. I'm done. Exhausted, don't have it, it's not in me. You need a new strength. I need your spirit. I need your life. I need your power inside of me. Isaiah, he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. What's the qualification for power? Weakness. It's no good telling everybody how strong you are. It's, the, it's your weakness that qualifies you for God's power. He says, even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord... Thou renew their strength. Thou soar on wings like eagles. Run and not grow weary, walk and not faint. You ever seen an eagle fly? Isn't that the most amazing thing? You know, you're traveling out in the outback and you see those eagles there and they're, they're like way up. Maybe they come down even closer. You can see them a bit more. And the one thing you notice about them is they ain't working. Right? They're just like... This, like their, their wings a bit, and they're just, they're just like circling, flying around, and it looks so easy. You know, we know, of course, that they're, what they're relying on is the thermal lift. Come on, how many know we need the lift of the Holy Spirit under us? But have you ever seen like ducks and chickens try and fly? <laughs> you know, they're, they're like flap, 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 and getting nowhere. You know, try to get over a fence, smack into the fence. <laughs> That's us for the most part. <laughs> but the challenge of the Bible is to soar on wings like eagles. Make that your prayer, Lord, I give up. Number two, we need a new identity. And if there's a prayer, it's simply, Lord, change me. Lord, I give up. Lord, change me. We need a new identity. Less of me, more of you. I must decrease, you must increase. And the angel says to Jacob, if this is going to happen, I need to give you a new name. I need to give you a new identity. And I think this is one of the great challenges of the Christian faith is to step into the new name that Christ has for you. There's a new name written down in glory and it's mine is the song we used to sing years ago. There's a new identity that God has for you. You don't have to be that same person. Forget the former things, Isaiah says. Don't dwell in the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. The worst thing you can do as a believer is to bring all your baggage and rubbish from your old life into your new life and then somehow try and make that Christian. Leave it all there. Give it up. Come on, I remember a famous story from back in the day. Many of the 
many people here will re remember there was a girl that came into the church and she's a really good singer, really good singer. And she was immediately started singing in the bands and stuff. And people were going, like, you're good. You look really good. And she said, you know, I used to sing back up for Cold Chisel. And people were like, wow, that's amazing. And so, you know, every, every time we had visitors come to the concert, we'd say, see that? She, she used to sing back up for Cold Chisel. She's that good. And anyway, like years went by. And then one day she got this revelation. And she sort of had to put her hand up and say, I never sang for Cold Chisel. It was just like a lie from her old life that carried over into her new life. And one day she realized, I don't need to, I don't need to have, I can just be me. I, it doesn't matter if I didn't sing for Cold Chisel. Here's the last one. We need a new joy. Many of us have learned how to make it look like everything's okay. You know, we, we just get a, a look smile, words, yeah, I'm fine, I'm great, good, praise the Lord. But for some of you, your soul is not right and you're dying. And what we need more than anything else is for God to bless us and place an internal joy inside of us. You know, I get smashed with all the things that you get smashed with, whether it's whether it's relational, financial, health, whatever. I'm the same as you. And, uh, you know, every Sunday I've got to get up and pretend like everything is great. And I, I learned many, many years ago that that's a mugs game. You can't do that. If you, if you do that, you get found out. And I realized what I needed is I needed real joy. I, need, I needed something real, like inside of me, that no matter what was going on in my life, yet still there was this base level of joy and happiness in Christ. And I found that in my life. And He has that for you. And, the, you know, you may be here today and you've lost that. You've lost that passion. You've lost that joy. It doesn't mean that you never experience sadness or loss or devastation, but you need that base level of joy in your life. Psalm 1611, you have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy, where? In your presence. How do you get joy in your life? Get into the presence of God. With eternal pleasures at your right hand. And the whole idea is, is that closeness to God, an encounter with Him and His presence, that, that's where joy is found. Lord, I give up. Lord, change me. And last of all, Lord, give me a new joy. And my, my prayer for you, you know, as you face the, the realities of unemployment, cost of living, relational challenge, breakdown, challenge, whatever, whatever you're facing, my, my prayer is that you would encounter God in such a way that there's just a level of passion and joy that never totally leaves you, that's always there. You only get that with an encounter. I thank God for real church. I think it's a great church. I thank God for what he's doing in our midst as people come and, and renew their faith, renew their commitment, and our church is growing. But can I tell you something? We, every single one of us, we desperately need an encounter with God. And, and I think we're doing our, ourselves a disservice. If we just walk into church and then we just tick off the three songs, tick off communion, tick off the preaching, and then we go, listen, that's not Christianity. That, that's not living the full life that God has for you. My prayer is that when you come through the doors of the church, there'll be something inside of you every Sunday that says, God, I want to encounter you. Can I tell you something? We pray here from 9.30 to 9.45 every Sunday morning. You're welcome to come and join us. It's, it's not limited to anyone. But every single Sunday morning, you ask the people that are there, I will pray. God, let there be a moment. Let there be an encounter. Let there be a time when people experience you. And that's my prayer for this church. Is it's more than just, you know, let's be technically correct on every scripture or let's have uh, make sure the liturgy runs and make sure the church service doesn't go past 11 o'clock. Listen, it's more than that. I want you to know God, experience Him, and have some sort of inner, inner, inner touch from Him. 
My prayer is as we sing these songs of worship, even if we sung them a million times before, even if they're old, whatever the song is, it doesn't matter. It's those words. Declare them and say, God, make that real in my life right now. Let me come alive in those words that I'm declaring. We need a close encounter of the God kind. Amen. So come on, would you pray with me today? And it's 11.01. How's that for liturgy? <laughs> I'm a minute late. If you're watching online or if you're sitting in this building and maybe there's a challenge to your heart because you're thinking, I don't have that experience. I've never had that experience with God. Listen, that encounter with God starts with a simple prayer. Literally, it's Lord, I give up. It's, it's Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I'm lost. I'm far from you but I want to invite you into my life. And in the simplicity of that prayer comes the power of God. And you can know him as a friend speaks to another friend face to face. You can know him in the same way. And you can have an encounter with God yourself. It doesn't mean you have to do something weird. It doesn't mean you have to shake. It doesn't mean you have to forget all that. You can have an encounter where something transforms your heart changes you. So if that's you today and you want to step into that for the very first time, pray this prayer with me, please. Dear Father in heaven, please come into my life and change me. I want to have an encounter with you. I ask you to forgive me of all my sin and I commit my life to you to live for you and to live in your strength and your joy and your forgiveness all the days of my life. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, I pray for them and I pray for every regular attender, every visitor, every member, every person in, under the sound of my voice that they would begin to walk in, in, a, new, in a new experience with you. Pray they'd have an encounter with you, whether it be here in church or driving in the car, singing worship songs or at home in a quiet place. I pray, Father, that our church would be a group of people that have experienced, that have had an encounter with the living God, that have talked to you face to face. Lord, be with us, strengthen us, help us. We admit our dependency. We admit our weaknesses. Lord, we give up. We're not enough. We don't have enough. And we cast ourselves upon you. We ask for your blessing in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, amen. <laughs>